Hi everyone, Quivine here at CIT's Blackrock Castle Observatory. Here at Blackrock, we were originally constructed as a fort to defend ships on the River Lee against piracy. We've grown a lot since then, but when we began, we were just a one-room fort with incredibly thick walls, 2.2 meters of solid limestone. That's thicker than I am tall. We needed these thick walls to keep out pirates, but they also came in handy to extend the fort up into a tower. It was used for meetings and dinners until it unfortunately caught fire in the 1720s. We're very lucky that the fire didn't go too far. Despite having gunpowder in our gunnery, we never actually blew up, but we came so close that when the castle was being rebuilt, we stopped functioning as a military building and began to operate as a banqueting hall. Kings, lords, ladies, lots of wealthy people came here for parties and dinners all the way up to the 1800s. Even some important political decisions were made here at Black Rock. But with so much fun, it's no surprise that we burnt down again in the later 1800s. Luckily, we were rebuilt one last time, very similar to the way you see us today. We operated as a rowing club, a meeting place, and even a house. Originally, people would have to climb 70 spiral steps to get from their ground floor to their bedrooms on the third floor. Luckily, a new stairs was added in the 1920s, which made it much, much easier for us to become a bar and a restaurant. From the 1960s till the 1990s, ordinary people came here for dinners, birthdays, weddings, 21sts, communion, any type of occasion you can imagine. Luckily, that chapter in our history didn't end with a fire and the castle was eventually taken back by the city, by Cork City Council. This allowed us to turn into the exhibit and observatory we are today, but even though we look out at stars and planets, we never forget the history that we have here at Black Rock. In this video, we will be taking a look at the sky for Culture Night, Friday the 18th of September. Because we are looking at a sky in September, we don't have to wait very late. We're here at just 8 o'clock looking into the south, and already the bright planet Jupiter is visible in the sky. 8 o'clock, even in September, is still quite early. We still have an orange-yellow glow from the sunset, but the bright object Jupiter is already coming out. Jupiter is brighter than any of the stars in the sky. Only the Sun, the Moon and Venus are brighter than Jupiter. So this evening, Jupiter will be the first thing to come out and it will be the brightest object in the sky for this evening. It's the first planet we'll see, but certainly not the only one. If we wait until really quarter past eight, Saturn will become nice and visible. We're already starting to see it here, but it is really by quarter past 20 past that it's easily visible in the sky. Of course, both of these dots are visible. Recognizing that they're Saturn and Jupiter can be tricky. Jupiter will be the brightest thing in the sky and Saturn is just next to it. But to help make sure that you're looking at planets, look at them for a few seconds and see if they twinkle or flicker. It's always twinkle, twinkle, little star. Planets don't twinkle or flicker in the same way. They appear a little bit stiller and a little bit steadier. So you can take a look at two planets as early as just quarter past eight. By the time we get into September, we won't have to wait very long for objects to appear in the sky. If you'd like to use a telescope, it is better to wait until a little bit later. Here we are at just quarter to nine and already the sky in the south is nice and dark. While there is a yellow glow of sunset in the sky, it can make a planet appear a little bit washed out, a little bit paler. Once the sky is dark, we'll be able to get a much better view. So we are going to take a quick look at these planets in the sky. I will start by using quite a small telescope. Due to the size of Jupiter and Saturn, they are very massive planets with a strong gravitational pull. This allows them to hold on to some very large moons orbiting around them. We can see Jupiter's four largest here, with Ganymede being about the size of the planet Mercury, almost big enough to be a planet by itself, but the massive pull of Jupiter is after reining it in so it orbits around the more massive planet. Ganymede, Callisto, Io and Europa are always changing positions. This is how they will look on culture night, but on other nights they can be in different places. Sometimes there only appears to be three, but on the best nights, even with a telescope just four or five inches wide, you should see four Galilean moons. 
Those are Jupiter's largest moons. As we take a closer look, we may see some smaller moons. That little dot is a smaller moon, but Jupiter's smaller moons are truly tiny. With a powerful telescope, you'll get a better view of the planet's atmosphere than you will these small moons. Jupiter is a gas giant, so what we're seeing is atmosphere. And here we can see the stripes that form at different temperature bands in the planet's atmosphere. Just like the Earth, it's hottest at the equator and colder at the poles, so we have these different stripes of colour forming. Unfortunately, on culture night, we won't see the great red spot. Jupiter sometimes is just facing the wrong way. When Jupiter rotates, the great red spot will face towards us again. This is how it will appear at the same time on the 19th with that massive storm facing towards us. On culture night, we do still see some of the smaller storms, which are very similar to tornadoes and hurricanes here on Earth. So Jupiter is a fantastic planet to look at, especially if you go out many nights in a row. You get to see the moons in different positions, and with a big telescope, you'll see that the planet is rotating and showing different sides. Saturn is further from us than Jupiter and a little bit smaller, so we do need a slightly more powerful telescope to get a good view. <clears throat> Something like this is often visible through telescopes just six or seven inches across. We're starting to see Saturn's rings here and some of the larger moons like Titan and Rhea. Titan is a particularly massive moon, big enough to hold its own atmosphere, which gives it a slightly orange colour. Its atmosphere is mainly made of methane and ethane, which are pretty nasty gases here on Earth, but at the cold, cold temperatures on Titan, they turn into liquids, forming clouds, rain, rivers and lakes. Just not the kind that we'd like to take a swim in. Most of Saturn's other moons will appear a pale white colour, either due to their grey, rocky surface, or in the case of some moons like Enceladus, their pale, icy surface. Taking a very close look at Saturn's rings, we can see the ring has gaps. These gaps are created by the pull of large moons like Titan, as well as smaller moons like Pan and Atlas moving closer to the rings. We can see Saturn's shadow here falling on the ring, which was a very good indication that the ring isn't attached to the planet, and the fuzzy inner edge of the ring helps us see that it is really a cloud of dust and rock and ice, with some of that rock and ice falling down into the atmosphere of the planet itself. Eventually, Saturn's ring will become too faint for a human eye to see, even with a telescope, but luckily that is very, very far in the future. We have lifetimes left to enjoy Saturn's rings. Both of these planets are visible, and with a telescope you can take a closer look before 9 o'clock. So we do have a very nice set of objects in the sky for culture night. To see some more, we will have to move just a little later. We are now turning around towards the east. Mars is just below the horizon before 9 o'clock, but as we move past 9 and up to 10 o'clock, it becomes nice and visible in the eastern sky. So this is just 10 o'clock in the evening. We still don't need to wait very late. Thankfully, September, the sun is setting that little bit earlier. Now, Mars is a much smaller planet, and it is not a gas giant. It has a very thin atmosphere, even for a rocky planet, so it doesn't reflect as much light as Jupiter or Saturn. However, thanks to its very thin atmosphere, the light we see reflected from Mars is reflecting mainly off its surface, which helped give Mars that famous reddish-orange colour. We can see a lot of that reddish-orange colour here. The lower parts of Mars usually have more of the sand and dust with the red-orange colour, whereas these darker areas are volcanic plateaus. Mars had volcanic activity millions of years ago, but due to Mars's size, it is a bit smaller than the Earth, it wasn't able to retain that heat. Mars cooled down on the inside, its magnetic field broke down when its liquid core stopped being liquid. Mars was also too small to retain water, so even though Mars had water, enough to react with iron, creating rust and giving Mars this lovely reddish colour, the weak gravity of Mars wasn't able to retain that water, meaning that Mars today is a very dry planet, 
and with a very thin atmosphere, a very cold one. Mars at the North and South Pole can reach minus 120 degrees Celsius in the winter, and even at the equator, the highest temperature you'll ever see in the summer is only about 20 degrees. We can even reach higher temperatures here in Ireland. So Mars is certainly quite a chilly place. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. They're both visible here on the 18th. Phobos comes from the Greek for fear, phobia. Deimos from panic, like dementia. Mars was the Roman god of war, so he caused fear and panic. Luckily, Phobos and Deimos aren't really that spooky. They're very small moons, and quite likely that they're asteroids that Mars captured, so they're very lumpy and bumpy, not quite as round and pretty as our own natural satellite. Uranus is out there. Unfortunately, Uranus isn't visible through a telescope, even in very dark skies. You need to know where it is near Mars and then point your telescope right at it in order to see it. But there is plenty more that we can see with just our eyes and without waiting till much later in the evening. If we turn away from Jupiter in the south, we will be looking into the northern sky and we have the plough or the Big Dipper over in the west, which can help us find the North Star. And just on the other side of the North Star from the plough, we have this lovely W shape of Cassiopeia. So Cassiopeia, the North Star, which is part of Ursa Minor, and the plough, which is part of Ursa Major, they're going to be nice and clear and visible from very early in the evening, three constellations that we can see down towards the south. This is our view from here in the city, but we will very quickly give a view for a darker country sky for anybody who will be enjoying culture night from the countryside. Here in Cork City, we do have a lot of houses and cars and streetlights which can shine light into the sky, blocking out faint objects. That leaves us with about 250 stars in the city. Here in the countryside, we can see about two and a half thousand stars, as well as seeing this lovely glow stretching from the northeast towards the southwest. This is the Milky Way, our galaxy. You'll see its center, which is a little wider and a little more colorful, down next to Saturn and Jupiter in the southwest. Its outer edge, this thinner, paler section, is back towards the north in the area of Cassiopeia. So all of this is visible by just 10 o'clock on Culture Night this year, and if you are in the countryside, you can get a fantastic view of the Milky Way, nice and early in September. So I hope you all get a chance to see at least some of these fantastic objects during Culture Night.